Welcome back to the Mindful Creator Podcast, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. If you're loving the episodes and if you're loving the guests, then please make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. Also, make sure you comment below with your favorite part of the episode or the part that impacted you the most from the conversation because I absolutely love hearing how the conversations are making a difference for you. Your interaction and engagement is what helps me make this podcast that much bigger and better with even more amazing guests and even more powerful conversations. None of this would be possible without you. So again, I'm hugely grateful. Thank you so much. And let's get into the show. And this is the second podcast live here in Dubai, which is officially making the Mindful Creator International, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, my guest today is uh, a good friend now as well, uh, Paddy Banway, who is the founder of Strive. Strive is a consultancy that is essentially dedicated to helping people from the UK or anywhere else in the world set up a footing and a company here in the UAE in Dubai. Um, essentially, not just setting up the company, mm -hmm. but I've been through this process myself and you guys have pretty much held my hand through this process to make this as seamless as possible. Because I can tell you now, <laughs> if I was doing this myself, I'd have absolutely <laughs> no idea what's going on. Pally, thanks yeah. so much for joining me. Thanks, Depesh. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. I'm glad we were able to support you as well with uh, getting you yeah. up and running over <laughs> here in this great city of Dubai. So, um, yeah, really looking forward to our conversation and happy to have you here in, in, in Dubai. Definitely. It's been awesome, man. Yeah. And um, honestly, like a testament before we even get into this to the team that you have uh, running in the background as well. Uh, they've been amazing. Communication has been incredible. And uh, myself and my wife would not have had as easy of a journey if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you so much for- no, I appreciate that. We tried to focus quite a lot on service and being quite responsive, you know, to our clients because it's a big step. It's daunting. You're coming, you're moving abroad or yeah. you're <laughs> doing something in a completely different country, right? So sometimes things don't work the same way. So yeah, we do try to put a bit of extra emphasis on trying to support and provide like good level of service and response times. And things like this. So yeah, uh, I'm glad you're happy. Things don't work the same way. People don't speak the same language. It's, uh, <laughs> it's all over the place, but <laughs> honestly, you guys have made it seamless. So thank you so much much yeah, thanks um now let's get into this because you are someone who originally is from the uk from west london to be specific indeed and uh, <laughs> not growing up so far away from where we are in northwest um you guys made the move out to dubai about six seven years ago right that's right yeah why why um well, basically, um, you know, you obviously know some of my background already, but I've generally been um, a bit of a serial entrepreneur uh, most of my life, um, my professional career. And uh, we got to a stage where actually we, you know, managed to sell one of our businesses and um, it was, you know, being done through earnout. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at that time, uh, me and my partner had had a baby as well. So, um, you know, we were sort of at home a lot <laughs> because yeah. I didn't have much to do after selling the business and some of the other interests I had I could you know I was operating them sort of from home anyway and then we thought hey why don't we go to Dubai try it out for a year or two and um, it was a tax efficient way for me to also get my earn out on my exit as well um, it was fairly it was fa fairly modest exit but then uh, uh, I, I still wanted to make the most of it and uh, yeah we took that opportunity and that window to come out here and uh, we haven't really looked back since so yeah that's amazing so, okay so um for people that don't know what is an earnout and how does it work um earnout is sometimes you know when you sell your company or you exit a business you can get paid out in various different ways you can have you can get paid in um, cash so you mm -hmm. get straight cash paid for your business sometimes that payment is done over a couple of years depending on how the business runs um, that, and you sometimes still have obligations to still meet certain KPIs and results in order to get your earn out. And in my case, it was simply just a uh, earn out based over time. So, and that was it. I think it's just some companies want to make sure that the business is what you say it is when you hand it over. Yep. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, earn out is quite common. Sometimes you'll find companies saying, Hey, would you like shares in our company exchange for your business and things like this? So mm -hmm. there's all, all lots of different ways um, earn outs work. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Mm. So the company that you got an earn out from, what was that company about? Um, that company was actually um, an events ticketing company. Mm -hmm. um, it was a marketplace for a lot of nightlife, um, sort of SME, sort of small micro events in London. It was called Chili Tickets. It was primarily focused on the South Asian community at the time, but then we broadened out as we got um, our reputation grew. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, it was a lot of fun. We, we th the way that uh, business started was just you know uh, just knee jerk. You know, we yeah. just felt we needed a platform where 
you know, we did, we could just easily, you know, book a ticket or get on a guest list to go out in on a night out in London or something like that. And then, you know, we sort of just, you know, I think the best ideas are always these organic ones yeah. anyway, right? That just grow <laughs> naturally. Definitely. And it just grew into something quite nice. And then uh, luckily for us, we got, um, a, a, you know, a, a, an opportunity to to sell it and move on and exit as well. So, which was nice. Okay, yeah. cool. So, Chili Tickets. That's right. Ticketing company for events. Chili Tickets, yeah. Which um, <laughs> you got your earn out from. Mm. And now you have a consultancy uh, that helps people set up their companies out here in Dubai. How did, does a transition like that <laughs> even happen? Yeah. Well, look, I think being in the entrepreneurial space, I'm very enthusiastic about supporting entrepreneurs and business owners in general. And I just, I felt the benefit of coming out here in Dubai from a business perspective. And I just thought, you know, I want to maybe share this knowledge and maybe educate um, people based in areas like the UK. But we also work with people across Europe and in Australia, Canada as well that are considering the move or maybe looked at it, but maybe a bit unsure. And so um, pure passion, really, just focused on something that I felt I was passionate about, which is supporting, you know, entrepreneurs um, with uh, understanding the benefits um, of, of being out here in a place like Dubai. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So benefits out here in Dubai. <laughs> Let's talk about some of them. What would you say are the key benefits of being out in a city like this? The purpose of this podcast is to help you make your dreams a reality in every area of life. And that includes traveling and exploring some of the world's most beautiful destinations like the Maldives. Myself and my wife took a trip to the Maldives last year and with the huge number of islands to choose from and the cost differences between all of them, it all became a little bit overwhelming. That's where Simply Maldives, a dedicated travel agency for all the islands, stepped in, gave us the best advice, helped us plan our perfect trip and got us a fantastic deal. That's why I'm proud and excited to say that I'm now partnered with Simply Maldives. Their expert knowledge can help you plan the perfect dream holiday. Whether you're traveling solo, traveling as a couple, traveling with your family and kids, or you have specific dietary requirements, they have something for you. So if you're interested in jetting off to the Maldives for your next dream holiday, then reach out to Simply Maldives through the link below, and I can guarantee you, you'll be well looked after. Um, you know, you could answer this as well, because yeah. you've just made the move. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, knew, I think from my, my perspective, the, the, it depends, you can look at it from a business perspective, and uh, a lifestyle perspective. So there's two sides of, of it. But from a business perspective, first of all, we all know, you know, Dubai is quite uh, low tax in terms of a economy. So there, there, there isn't an income tax here, for example. So if you mm -hmm. move uh, out of your home country and live in Dubai for a certain period of time, then, you know, you don't have to pay any income tax. Um, there's no capital gains tax. So if you dispose of assets and things like this, and um, and generally, um, if you open a business here, corporation tax is, is only 9% on your net profits, which is a lot lower than some of the rates out in um, sort of more westernized economies, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. And uh, so, yeah, it gives you a great opportunity to sort of optimize for taxation yeah. um, as well. VAT is only 5% here as well. Mm -hmm. if, if that applies to you, it's not too high and not too burdensome. Um, you know, we've seen in the news, especially statistically, the tax burden across Europe has increased on many individuals as earnings have stayed quite stagnant for people. Yep. And the percentage they're paying in direct and indirect taxes has actually gone up as a, a, on the whole as a percentage of their total income. So um, I think a lot more people are starting to sort of question that. And hence a place like Dubai becomes like an option they might be willing to consider in terms of a move um, over here. And whereas before, maybe they were, you know, not too worried about things like that. What would you, could you give an example of a direct slash indirect tax? Because uh, I'm assuming direct <laughs> is like your, what you see in your PAYE slip or what you see in your VAT return, etc. when you're doing your personal tax bills. So what would be an indirect tax? Yeah, so, you know, your indirect taxes are, for example, when you buy goods in the UK, you pay 20% VAT if you're an end consumer. Um, you pay tax on quite a lot of tax on fuel yeah. in the UK as well. So they're, they're what I call indirect taxes. And direct taxes can be like obviously your income tax, um, CGT, capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. But also I help most of my, m m actually most of our clients are sort of solo entrepreneurs, maybe two shareholder, three shareholder companies. Mm -hmm. So even the corporation tax they're paying on their profits of their business to them feels like direct tax as well. Yeah. Because, you know, you're paying corporation tax and then you're paying yourself dividends afterwards. So the sum of that can be sometimes upwards of 50, 60%. Mm -hmm. And that's just the direct stuff. 
and then you've got all the other um you know uh, other other areas of tax as well but you know i don't want to sit here and sound as um anti-tax yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know i believe but i just we just believe in a fairer policy when it comes yeah. to taxation and we think that device sort of got a much fairer outlook on 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 that side of things you know there's perfectly good roads here there's a mm -hmm. uh, you know no potholes and um, you know low crime rates to to zero crime rates pretty much and it shows that it can be done it can be achieved without having to sort of sort of put you know charge so much tax on people as well yep. so you know it shows that you know you can have you know nice clean streets without having to yeah. you know pay a lot of money <laughs> to the government <laughs> as well Definitely. so yeah okay so let's talk a little bit about the type of people that you are typically seeing coming out here like you said kind of solopreneurs or small companies that are setting up their um well establishing themselves out here in mm -hmm. dubai what typically do you see as the type of company coming out here and what kind of business activity are they doing oh wow i mean i've seen a, f a, a, a whole range a myriad of different types of businesses actually it's been quite f quite a lot of fun seeing okay. um all these different types of uh, entrepreneurs and seeing how they've created their wealth and their businesses uh, as well so you know, we get actually get a lot of sort of online coaches and trainers, mm -hmm. uh, influencers as well moving across. Um, I've had a lot of IT specialists and sort of software companies as well set okay. up shop here as at the same time. And, um, you know, so we've also seen, you know, people set up things like holding companies just for sort of wealth protection mm -hmm. and things like this. Um, so that, for example, if they have an exit, then maybe the, the, the proceeds from that exit maybe move into a uh, more tax friendly sort of holding company based out here. So there's a whole variety of use cases, Defesh actually. Um, I can't really put my finger on saying there's one primary type of business that really sticks out. Um, I've seen dentists, I've seen uh, people wanting to open cafes, we've had consultancy businesses, yep. um, so a whole range of companies, yeah. Okay, that's good to know because mm. it's not just like one type of business that's coming out here, there's actually people with all, well, I guess as an entrepreneur, you're going to have a hundred different ideas anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's people coming with all those ideas and establishing themselves out here, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit. Look, it's January, <laughs> as you know, in the UK. I know where you're going with uh, yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, taxes are the, the tax deadline is about to be here. What's the yeah. date today? It's the 23rd. So about eight a week's days. Time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So exactly eight days. Everyone's going to be paying off their tax bill, <laughs> and we're talking about Dubai being a place that is. Uh, not just lenient on tax, but a bit more uh, tax friendly mm. for people where people get to keep more of their earnings. Mm -hmm. Practically speaking, can you go through some numbers on what someone could be saving and a, pit a particular example you've got? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I think, you know, first of all, January is really busy for us. I think it dawns on people when they <laughs> prepare their tax return, their personal tax return and uh, how much they're going to be paying. But to give you an example, um, let's say you have a, a, a successful business you know, you're going to be paying but you know 19 to 25 percent corporation tax on those profits and let's say you own 100 percent of that company so it's almost as if you're paying that tax yourself mm -hmm. so once you pay that out and let's say um you're drawing a dividend um if you're you know drawing a small dividend the tax isn't too high on the dividend itself uh, but if you're quite successful and your business is growing you may even end up paying, uh, you know, above thirty percent, maybe even higher than that on your dividend. So mm -hmm. when you add thirty percent to, you know, twenty five percent or so, you're looking at paying out around fifty to sixty percent straight away, just off the back of the combination of your corporation tax and your dividend, to join, mm -hmm. you know, together. And then obviously you've got things like, you know, you, you know, when you live out, live in the UK, you have to pay council tax for yep. where you live. Um, then you've got obviously, like we mentioned, VAT at 20%. So, you know, by the time you sort of, you know, add everything together, it does erode away at, um, at your earnings quite substantially, especially when you go into the higher rate area um, and you start earning a bit more. And um, that's where I think people are getting a bit frustrated sometimes because they feel as though they've worked so hard to get to that point of, you know, where they can feel a bit more, feel a sense of freedom, a bit more comfortable. And then they find that, you know, they're not able to hold on to as much of maybe their earnings as they would like. And so this is where, you know, a place like Dubai does come into play. And it could, it's a good, you know, potential plan B or actually, you know, just, you know, some people just think, right, I'm just going to move out here and try it out, you know, and off you go. <laughs> That's amazing. So let's let's actually look at some figures here and see what the real difference is. Because I know in the mm. UK, you've got uh, typically that 19 to 25% corporation tax bracket, depending on 
uh, how much you're earning as well. Uh, but then you've got your tax free allowance, which is just uh, around the 12k mark. 12, yep. <laughs> and then you're going to be paying your dividend tax at seven and a half or eight yeah. percent, yeah. which then goes up to 32 when you get mm. into your high rate tax pay mm -hmm. as well. So you're paying quite a lot of tax at mm. different stages. And mm -hmm. then if you're past 85,000 a year, mm -hmm. well, then you're paying VAT as well, which is at 20%. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And okay. if you have a, like, uh, if you like got a B2C sort of business as well, then, you know, some, you know, the end consumers picking up the VAT bill, aren't they yeah. as well? So then it puts pressure on pricing and um, what you can price your products at at the same time yep. too. So, yeah, I mean, Look, most of our clients are our clients that are, are fairly successful now, and uh, you know it's it's definitely you know <laughs> this is the the major cause for concern that they have is is uh, you know trying to be more tax efficient you know in the, in their business moving forward. So definitely. Yeah. So we obviously mm. had this conversation, mm. and I think it would be amazing for everyone <laughs> listening to actually hear this yeah. as well. So we just went through what the general tax bands and percentages are mm. for a limited company in the UK. Yep. What would someone expect to pay and over when here. over here? Okay, so first of all, corporation tax was introduced in the UAE in June 2023. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are some exemptions. So, for example, if your revenue is below 3 million dirhams a year, um, in, in dollars, that's around 800,000 US dollars, yeah. then you can still pay zero corporation tax on your profits. Once you go above that figure, um, of, of revenue, then you pay 9% on your net profit. Um, so that's after all your costs are taken out of the business. You pay 9% on net profits above 375,000 dirhams. So you still get a little bit of a, a tax-free allowance inside the company itself. And 375,000 dirhams, I believe, is around the $100,000 mark. Correct, yeah, it's uh, just around the $100,000 yeah. mark. So, um, And then when you draw the money out, obviously there's no income tax here. So you don't pay any further tax on 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 that on that um, amount that you that you withdraw, and uh, the nice thing is there's no personal tax return to fill in over here as well, so you don't have to worry about all that admin that comes with that side of things at the same time. And um, then the only other thing you need to bear in mind is VAT. So businesses have to register for VAT here once they go over a turnover of 375,000 dirhams, again, $100,000 or so. And then you, know, you just file your VAT returns every quarter uh, mm -hmm. and, and pretty straightforward process, pretty much in line with you know, fairly other, you know, other places like the UK and other parts of Europe as well. So um, they're the only two that you really have to consider um, in terms of from a tax perspective out here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now... Let's talk about this from the perspective of someone's mindset, someone's, uh, I guess, comfort in being where they've been versus coming out here, which is obviously uh, a complete change. It's an upheaval of everything you've done. Now, you've gone through this yourself where you kind of left everything behind and decided to come out here. What type of mindset would benefit someone to make that move? Mm. What helped you? I mean, I think when you're a business owner, you, you know, you tend, I think you, those people tend to have a sense of risk and a bit of adventure. They don't mind taking those leaps uh, of faith. And, um, you know, one thing I always say to people is make sure you visited and been to Dubai or a place like Dubai before. Or that goes for anywhere you might be thinking of, of, of moving to or shifting to. You might be moving for financial reasons or, or lifestyle reasons. So um, I think, you know, for me, uh, I think the mindset is obviously, I think generally because this is part of the Middle East, a lot of people, uh, you know, aren't sure about how things are governed. Is it secure from a political standpoint, and so forth and so forth. And this is where I think Dubai stands out um, because it's proven over the course of time that, you know, it's very consistent in terms of the way it's governed, um, its policies, in terms of its results as well, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think... You know, you have to remember we're sitting in a place which is around maybe 20 years old, just yep. over 20 years old. So, it's, 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 you know, it takes time for a city to grow a personality and generate substance. And there's a whole button, you know, and, and for it to work its personality and how it's going to run. And I think Dubai is now going across that line. And this is where people are now, I think that belief system that of, of moving across to a place like Dubai I think more and more people are starting to sort of understand the the benefits and more willing to take that leap of faith and, and come across. Yeah. I mean, we went to the Museum of the Future <laughs> two days ago and it is crazy to see, like you said, Dubai is kind of 20 years old. Over the last 50 years, it has 
grown incredibly fast. And then you think, well, if this is what they did in 50 years here, then actually what they're showing in the Museum of the Future, even though it's <laughs> like sci-fi, futuristic, there's robots, there's like, uh, what's it called, drones, there's hovering cars, there's like uh, crazy fast train transportation, <laughs> all that stuff. You think, well, if they did all of this in 50 years, then actually maybe that's not so far mm. away. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Dubai is shown that it's building a, a, a very modern infrastructure um, and it's building, um, you know, it's got some great minds contributing. Um, there's a lot of uh, work being done around sort of uh, food security, innovation in that space. There's innovation in sort of energy security as well. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, um, if you look across to somewhere like Saudi, they're building one of the biggest solar energy plants in the world. Mm. And, and I think there's a lot of innovation in this space. And I think what you've seen at the Museum of the Future, um, you know, is examples of, you know, the ambition and, and also the capability a place like Dubai has now to deliver on some of these sort of projects and some of these super projects. And I think um, it's showing now that, you know, it can reliably deliver on a lot of these projects that, that are coming down the line for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm. I mean, I'm super excited to see some of the stuff that comes out. <laughs> uh, definitely. Mm. So you're a parent. You have kids. I have a boy. Yes. Yes. Indeed. So, <laughs> you know, there's probably a lot of people listening to this who are in a position where they've got one, two, three or, or more kids and they're thinking about making the move. What was that like for you to decide that actually you know the education system here might be better like mm. is it better mm. uh is it actually as safe as people say or you know do you have to take everything with a pinch of salt that's a great question actually and one thing i do want to jump in and say here is the, the primary motivation for us to move out here and m me pushing the move was very much to do with the financial opportunity and that side of things but the reason we've remained is because of the safety and the lifestyle, really? to be honest. And um, and that's that's something, you know, I, I've traveled, you know, to, you know, to many, many places around the world. And uh, one thing I have to say with Dubai is, is this, I just get complete peace of mind when it comes to safety on, for my, you know, for my son and, and for my family. Uh, and so for me, that has become um, one of the leading factors on, on staying here. I think, you know, we're both from London. We've seen the statistics regarding crime um, over there and, you know, petty crime increasing, violent crime increase, increasing. And so, you know, it, it does, you know, I do feel very lucky to be based over here. I mean, where, where I live, I live downtown just around a park. And sometimes I sit on my balcony, you know, late night around midnight, I'm, you know, having a coffee or a cup of tea. And I look down and I see at midnight. Is that what happens here? This is like the lifestyle. Well, I'm always it? working. So <laughs> sometimes I need to pick me up. Okay. Um, and so and I'm looking down at the park and I still see mothers playing with their babies at, you know, late night in, yeah. in, in the park. And I think, wow, this is how it really should be. Um, I, I, you know, I've never had to call uh anyone in my family about where they are when they're going to get home how they're getting home, getting home and i think that that i think is overlooked but when you sort of have been here a while and you say do travel back to say you know a place like london you do sort of feel wow you know i'm so much more on edge all of a sudden you know and in in the back of your mind it does take up noise it does take up space and so um from a from a safety perspective i think that's fantastic from an educational perspective I mean, we've been really happy with uh, how um, the system has worked out for my son. And uh, he goes to like an English school here, which is operated by a, a group that have private schools in the UK as mm -hmm. well that they manage and run. And um, yeah, he's really he's in a really nice, diverse school. He's mixing with lots of different types of kids. Um, you know, obviously the weather's great, so he's doing a lot more outdoor stuff. You know, he could swim lengths in the pool by the age of five. So, you know, wow. this is yeah, great. Yeah. So things like this um, are, are, are a big benefit. Schools have got great facilities here as well. And the teachers are great. You know, the teachers generally get the experience from, you know, parts of Europe. And so you do get some great teachers here with a lot of um, good experience behind them at the same time. So, yeah, all in all, I would say it is, it is a good, good environment for education. Yeah. The, I love that. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that mm. we've considered being out here as well, because we don't have kids right now, but we're planning on it. So... Mm -hmm touch wood all goes to plan and uh you know the lifestyle that we've seen like we're staying in dubai creek harbor for this trip that we're out here mm. and uh it's a new community it's fairly like fresh i mean 
just like most things here anyway. And um, it is amazing to see just how many people, we're, it's January right now, right? The UK has just gone through, I think, three storms. Uh, there's <laughs> a third count. one. Yeah, there's a third one coming apparently between today oh, and tomorrow really? or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been minus four or five. It's just kind of warmed up a little bit. But being outdoors and spending that time, seeing kids here playing in the sand or playing in a park and seeing that is it's almost like a element of disbelief that that's even possible <laughs> uh, because back home that that's not a, re a thing that really happens and mm -hmm. it forces people to stay indoors on most occasions so then you become more of uh, mm -hmm. essentially more like a, a hermit who's yeah. spending more time <laughs> on screens uh, i don't know how else to describe that <laughs> um so it is interesting the yeah. the safety aspect is even right now it's still quite difficult for me to wrap my head mm -hmm. around because we obviously in London, like you're going to, if you leave something out, like a phone on a table, it's going to go, it's going to go fast. Someone's going to see it. Someone will take an opportunity. It's going to be, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. going to disappear. Now we were at dinner the other night, um, out near JLT, um, a really nice restaurant, Canary club. I think mm -hmm. it is. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, put my bag on the side and I remember Chris sitting next to me going, is that going to be okay? <laughs> and even in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, just keep an eye on it. Mm. And you're like, okay, well, over here, that doesn't really happen. Mm. Now, that's what I've heard from everyone. Is it true that that, that level of crime and stuff doesn't mm. actually happen here as much? I always leave my laptop bag on my passenger you know, seat in the car and just really? leave it. And it's visible. I that had a cousin, crazy. actually had a cousin over here last week. And uh, he had a he had a he had a bag in the car. He goes, oh, "Can I put it in the trunk?" I go, "Why?" He goes, "Because people can see it." I'm going, "Don't worry about <laughs> it." You know, there's more chance of us forgetting about it and leaving it in the trunk and driving off with it. You know, yeah. so just leave it in the front seat. <laughs> he couldn't get his head around it either. And uh, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, one of our clients uh, that we were supporting, he went for his Emirates ID appointment to get mm. his biometrics done, and he took off his wedding ring. And it was quite an expensive wedding ring. It was a Cartier uh, wedding ring. Nice. And he placed it on in the booth because uh, you go in a booth to do your fingerprints. And he forgot it there. He re realized Jesus. around 24 hours later. And he goes, guys, my wedding ring. Um, my wife is going crazy right now. She's <laughs> like, why have you taken your wedding ring off? <laughs> um, so she was probably thinking all sorts, you know, so <laughs> let's leave it at that. But um, Went to yeah. go get an Emirates ID. <laughs> yeah. And so then, you know, it was there. It was, still, it was still in the booth. No one had even touched it. Really? Yeah. No one had even, even sort of touched it. And then the next day, Joanna, who works in our team, went down there, collected it and got it delivered to him. So... You know, there, there's a lot of these actual stories. You know, um, I've had times where I've left my sunglasses in places and I'm like, oh, I'll just get it tomorrow. I'm not panicking. Yeah. And I go the next day and they're just sitting there and no one's even touched them. They're just in this exact angle I left them <laughs> in. <laughs> and so, it, I mean, you know, it, it is pretty safe. I wouldn't say, you, you know, you shouldn't, you know, I think everyone should generally just look after their belongings in, in general you know, yeah, yeah. and not be frivolous about it. But, um, you know, we are quite lucky to be living in a place where there's very, very low crime rates. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Well, mm. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, less of it <laughs> rather, because, uh, you know, even on I think it was New Year's Eve, um, do you know Primrose Hill um, um, in West Hampstead? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh everyone goes to the park and the hill for new year's eve for a place to watch the fireworks celebrate mm. they're having drinks in the park etc uh but even on that night um we found out the next morning that a 16 year old was stabbed on oh, new year's no. eve no. like died on the scene which is mm. crazy to think like you know 16 years old got your whole life ahead of you and that's mm. just unfortunately what it's like over there, which is absolutely crazy. You know, it's different. I don't know if you, you, you feel the same. You know, I, I rarely open up um, news apps now, mm -hmm. uh, especially you know, when it comes to like back home and from you know news from the UK. Um, but every time there's some sort of you know protest or gathering of people. The news always ends with, by the way, the police arrested five individuals. Yeah, yeah, da, 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 da. And it's, it, you just think to yourself, it's become the norm. It's, yeah. it's almost like people ex expect this stuff to be the norm and that you have to put up with it. But you don't. You really don't. You know, if you have a if you change your belief system and you open your mind up a bit more and you start getting out there and traveling and you connect with the right people, 
you know, you, you don't have to necessarily, you know, put up with this stuff. And, you know, like, you know, a place like Dubai is such an easy place to come and move to and get residency, if, you know, and, and give it a shot. You've seen yourself, you yeah. know, within two, three weeks, you're up and running here pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. And there's not many countries in the world that have that sort of system where you can get, you, you, you're you allowed to live there within a few weeks. Yeah. You, know, you normally have to go through a much more of a rigorous process. So <coughs> I, I feel that, you know, I don't think people necessarily need to accept this. And I think... Um, you know, at some point or another, you know, obviously, you know, people can put pressure on MPs and, and, and governments in their own countries. But you also have to start thinking, well, you know, maybe what can I do practically as well to to improve the opportunities for myself and my family members and including obviously their safety as well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like your mindset, your belief system has become more positive as a result of being here? compared to what it was back there or do you feel like your mindset because you've been in the entrepreneurial space was already kind of set into that optimistic view of life i've, well, I've been told i'm too optimistic sometimes <laughs> so <laughs> people tell me to calm down um <laughs> I, I've, I've heard calm down multiple times so yeah <laughs> and so i no I, i've i've I, look from uh, every person is different um and there's no right or wrong way you know sometimes you can be a very risk adverse conservative um, sort of entrepreneur and do really well for yourself as well you don't mm -hmm. always have to be that charismatic person um, but I've always been very optimistic and uh, and so you know for me it wasn't that much of a you know a leap um, psychologically to to you know move across or come out here or or, or make changes yeah fair enough mm -hmm. I did hear from someone that we were speaking to the other day um, it was actually a girl called Gori who joined the podcast as well Mm. And um, she was talking about how since they've been out here, they don't even look at the news as much anymore because mm. like the, the environment is so much more positive as well. Mm. And that is a huge difference because like obviously we're still getting BBC news alerts here. Yeah. Um, and it's just one thing about the storm. It's one yeah. thing about like attack situation. It's just one thing after the other that you're constantly bombarded with. Mm. And it's it's interesting <coughs> to see how this place operates versus the UK where since we've been out here, it has generally been like, we've not had a reason to really worry about anything, which <laughs> is interesting to have that mindset. You don't even get letters here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't even get letters. Seriously. You don't even get letters. If you ever look at all uh, like the apartments, you'll notice there's no letter boxes. <laughs> That's a good point. That's <laughs> and, a good point. Even, and so if you get a bit of mail, it's normally done by a courier. But, you know, um, there, there's just n there isn't that sort of I call uh, noise, mm. you know, in the background. They just you don't find you have that noise where you've got letters coming through the door. You've got all this news being pumped at you and thrown at you, um, whether it's relevant or not. You know, it's a huge distraction from your day to day. And so you just, uh, I'll just call it, you know, that, that, that noise, that subliminal noise in the background, you sort of find it's a lot less here as well. So it allows you to focus on other things like your lifestyle, like your business, um, you know, you know, your recreational activities and things like this. Um, so yeah, uh, you're, I'm not surprised that like, you're sort of finding yourself already like just realizing actually there's nothing else really going on here yeah. that I need to worry about or consume myself with, you know, that I think every, again, it's another reason why I think people like being here as well, because it, all, all that other sort of, I call element of head trash is mm -hmm. sort of out, you know, it's not, not getting in the way of your thinking. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're someone who is quite entrepreneurial. You don't have a typical working day. Do you actually really have a better lifestyle being here? Do you, what allows you to create a better lifestyle for yourself? Because you're someone who's working UAE hours, but then you're also mm. facilitating for UK hours, which is right now a four hour time difference until mm -hmm. the clocks change. Yeah. Like where do you find time for a lifestyle in all of that? Um, so I think one thing to bear in mind is Dubai is actually quite a small place. It's not, it's not like London where it takes, you know, four hours to get from one side to the other, you know, because of the traffic and the road network and the trains not working and things like this. So it's actually quite easy to sort of dip over to the Palm, pop back into downtown, you know, and uh, and go across to sort of maybe if you want to go to, you know, the older, older side of Dubai or, and, and things like this. So it's actually quite an easy place to navigate, you know, and, and get around. 
So that helps when you want to sort of, you know, you know, go to the beach or mm -hmm. you want to, you know, go to, you know, a restaurant somewhere um, as well with the family. Look, my, my, I think everyone's basically, I think everyone's um, timings are different. My, my day gets going after lunch pretty much um, because that's when Europe sort of starts waking up. And obviously we have a lot of work to do with Europe. And so it's nice to have the mornings, you know, just to do the school run, you know, maybe get a bit of a gym session in, mm -hmm. um, you know, get a good, decent breakfast going, you know, because I know sometimes we don't all sacrifice uh, these sort of, you know, the opportunities to, to, to look after ourselves and nutritionally as well. So I like my routine. I, I'm quite happy with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, balancing a lifestyle here, I definitely found it easier than London, you know, but a long way, a long, long way. And, um, you know, I think a lot of that is to do with um, the options and these options are available within a stone's throw away. And there's some great deals out there. You know, there's, there's some, so many new things to check out. It's easy to connect with people here and hang out. And so your social life, you, you know, you'll find is really, you know, you can really scale up, you know, very fast over mm -hmm. here. Um, but I'm not just talking about the glamorous stuff, like, you know, the Dubai bling side of things. <laughs> But my day to day is grabbing a coffee with a couple of friends or maybe a drink in the evening. And, you know, I've got great friends. I've got, you know, um, you know there's a there's a group of us and, you know, we've got this table we sit at. We call it like the friends couch, you know, nice. because <laughs> if someone else sits there, it's really awkward. <laughs> and the reason I'm mentioning this is just to highlight that there's an element you can have an element of normality in Dubai. And I think that's what people are actually afraid of, that they might miss that element of normality in their mm -hmm. day to day. Um, because what you see on TV is like the flashy cars, the big hotels, the fancy restaurants, you know, um, and all the brands, you know, people are, you know, branded up, you know, to the hilt. But actually day to day is not, is not necessarily like that at all. So, you know, I've got friends here that are Emirati. I've got friends that are from Saudi. You know, I've got a good friend of mine from Middlesbrough yeah. <laughs> in the middle of it all. So, yeah, it's uh, from... Um, you know, you know, that work life balance. I think it's a personal choice, but from my side of things, it's, it's, it's got a bit of everything, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about Strive. Sure. Okay. So Strive is obviously your baby out here mm -hmm. in Dubai. Now, there are, I'm assuming, uh, I don't know all of them, but I'm assuming that there are quite a few companies that are helping people set up companies here and uh, get established, etc why not why how do you guys separate yourselves from what everyone else is doing yeah no that's a great point actually there are many uh formation agents out here that help people set up companies and when we sort of done a, a swot analysis uh, for strive i think the biggest strength we had was our understanding of uh, uk entrepreneurship and um, because we've done it we've done it ourselves we've gone through being entrepreneurs we understood like the the financial side of things the tax side of things very well from a personal perspective from a business perspective and we just make sure we keep our knowledge up to date there so we sort of specialize uh, you know we, we had to find our niche you know there's no point going out there and saying we could do everything um you know so we found our niche and our niche was basically individuals and businesses based outside of the uae that want to come in to the uae who are currently operating in sort of high tax sort of um, economies. So that could be obviously the UK, Western Europe, Scandinavia. There's, you know, taxes are quite high there. Mm -hmm. You've got, we're getting quite a few Australian clients as well, getting interested Interesting. At, at the same time. So I think what makes us different is that the, our addressable market is currently fits our strength profile really well. And so we're very good at staying focused and on our, staying on our lane rather than getting, you know, too distracted with, you know, you know, maybe the local market or uh, other territories as well. So that's the primary reason I think we're growing so well at the moment. Mm. That's amazing. Mm. What do you think makes, what do you think, this is a two-part question, mm -hmm. makes you a good leader for Strive? And how are you attracting the team members that you have that echo your way of working with clients and doing business? I keep, there's a running joke that I keep using these days, which is I need to find a way to clone myself or <laughs> can someone, you know, <laughs> maybe someone needs to create something. So I think, you know, one, one of the things we did decide right from the beginning is that we were going to get, we were going to get technology to play a bigger part in how this business was going to scale and be managed going forward. 
And so we've invested a lot of time in sort of proprietary tech that we've built ourselves to uh, speed up things like, you know, proposal generation. Um, we're using Elmo AI in that now as well. Um, even our ops processes, you know, we've got very clear sort of um, project management tools uh, already integrated into our CRM system. And then we've also got uh, our accounting system integrated with our CRM and proposal generator. So it automatically creates and spits out client invoices. So we've really tried to make sure we're operationally lean, which then takes pressure away of having to find <laughs> so many, you know, people that are like minded, haven't got the mm -hmm. have got a like minded mindset. Um, but so I think that's always a challenge in a fast growing business because sometimes you can compromise mm -hmm. on, you know, the types of personalities you need in your business just because, you know, you have to throw human capital at your growth, you know, mm -hmm. to solve the growth and manage the growth. And so we've spent the first six months actually, you know, getting ready for scale, getting ready for growth in such a way that we actually don't need to go and recruit like an army of people. Uh, that being said, <laughs> when we do recruit, we're very, very slow and careful with who comes and joins the team. We look at uh, the right culture fit. We look at people that, um, you know, most of our clients are overseas. So our team has flexibility to work from home quite a lot. So we're looking for people that are self-motivated, um, also understand that, you know, they have responsibilities and they don't require a lot of heavy micromanagement. And luckily, we have a team like that in Strive so far. Um, some of the team members in Strive have been working with me for five, six years. So mm -hmm. we all know each other's style and, and, and we know what the expectations are just organically. Um, but finding people for me is all about core values, you know, making sure core values of those individuals align with the core values of the business. And, um, you know, one of our major core values is service. <laughs> and you've mentioned it right at the start yeah. today. You know, you could probably feel that there's service. And, you know, if a client hasn't got response, we're all saying, hey, by the way, we need to get back to this individual, this individual. So very rarely will a client have to always chase us. Well, it's normally the other way around where we start and we actually have to nag <laughs> them <laughs> for information, I hope. Um, so, yeah, it's about core values, core values being aligned, you know, as well. So, you know, that's always a challenge. But, um, you know, one way we're getting around that challenge is by not having to be in such a hurry to recruit so quickly as well so okay so it. that's something that i want to pick on mm -hmm. right because there's a lot of social media stuff out there there's a lot of uh very successful people that talk about hiring people fast and essentially firing people faster so you basically take on people as quickly as possible and then if they're not the right fit uh essentially disregard mm. them get them out of the company and bring someone else new in where do you get the philosophy of hiring slow mm. and you know how do you even have the infrastructure set up where you can spend the time to spend like six months at the beginning to set up it and everything else because the most common thing you hear in business is get started get people on board and figure out the it and stuff later yeah that's like the y combinator uh, mantra you know yeah. so I've done it both ways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've done both scenarios. The reason why I think it's very business specific. The reason why with Strive we wanted to spend six months on infrastructure because we already felt we knew the playbook towards scale. When the time came, we knew which buttons to push. Because in the background we'd been experimenting on we we're doing lots of A B tests on different types of marketing experiments and things like this. So we could see which ones are working and then behind them, behind the ones that work, which ones have scalability. So we are sort of, we're ready for scale. Um, and because I've been in this industry for a while, experience counts. So, you know, the, the, the philosophy of build it and then iterate as quick as you can normally comes, it normally comes into play when you've got a new idea mm -hmm. you're trying to bring to the market and where you don't have a reference, where you don't have prior experience. Um, but in this case, you know, we I, I'm from this industry um, because before Strive, I was CEO of one of the larger players out here. So, you know, there was that experience behind us. And because I led the growth marketing um, on, on, on during that time, in terms of scaling up and getting the, the sales funnel really, you know, ballooning and expanding, 
it, we we knew the playbook and know the playbook on that already. So we thought, well, we don't want to get into a situation where we're catching in our tail, running around chasing our tail, because you know now we're growing so quickly. You know, all these clients are going to need managing, and now we're going to have to obviously resource up for that. So, it's it, I think it depends. It really depends on what sort of business you're getting involved in, hiring and firing fast. I think that's a bit of a myth. You know, you hire people. We all know it's not easy <laughs> letting yeah. people go. And, you know, because you have to give people time to, you know, develop, you know, bed in. You have to see if people can sort of get those results through the door. Um, I think that hire, hire fast, fire fast. I think reality, I don't think it p- pays off. I think it takes up a lot of um, time from the leadership as well, you know, and takes time away from the leadership um, on focusing on business development when, you know, because... You know, HR is, is is quite heavy on admin and 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 uh, on the mind as well. So I'm not too much of a believer in that hire and fire fast philosophy. I think that's a bit bit of a myth. Yeah, to be honest as well. Mm. Fair enough. Mm. How much time do you think people should be allowed to have to settle into something new before you have to make a decision to say this clearly isn't working? Do you have like a rough idea? I have, I have two I have two rules here. So first of all. I think it shouldn't take more than three to four months to know if someone's going to, you know, take off and do well. And I also have a rule where if I find that I'm I'm getting that sense of becoming, that I'm having to micromanage them rather than coach them, I sometimes feel I might have made a hiring mistake okay. as well. So obviously it depends on the seniority that you're hiring for as well. But, um, you know, you want... You know, you know, I like individuals that are that don't require much micromanagement, who are willing to take risks and potentially fail as well, and learn from those mistakes, rather than sitting on the bench on the sidelines waiting for someone to make their decisions for them. You know, as well. So, for me, those are the two things I look at. Timeline, I look at three to four months, but then I also try to assess it through how much micromanagement am I having to do? Can I see this person driving things, and can they show me some shoots of leadership where they can sort of drive things forward, um, even if it's a uh, the it's it's, it's a entry level role you know in the business as well. Okay, you said something there which I think might terrify a lot of people as well, which is you want people to take risks, make decisions, and if they fail at that, then that's great because they're still doing something that could lead to innovation. Yeah. How do you mm-hmm. how do you get someone to be comfortable with the idea of failing? Where in a lot of places, the idea of failing would lead to disciplinary, it would lead to uh, potentially being fired, it could lead to so many negative things. Mm. How do you encourage that? I think this is where the rest of the team come into play because if they can show support and encouragement to that individual because they've gone through that process themselves, they can give the individual a fair bit of confidence. Um, you know, ob- and there is still some element of control. You wouldn't let someone fail at something that could be <laughs> disaster, f- you know, a disaster for the business or something <laughs> as well. And I think you, you know, you start off with small steps, you know, baby steps. You know, w- you know, you really want create, you know, you want you want creativity from your team, and you know, you can't have creativity if there's a culture of sort of fear. You know, you know, creativity is where like you're going to land on some great ideas. You know, we spoke about one of my startups previously that we sold in the UK. The name for that company, Chili Tickets was just thrown out there in the middle of nowhere <laughs> while someone was just typing something on their computer and then everyone just paused and looked at each other and they go, hold on a second. But that's because that person had the confidence to be open and do things like this, you know, rather than being a little bit shy and, and intimidated. So I think you just have to have that um, culture of sort of um, encouragement and, um, and if your other team members have also felt the benefit of it, then they'll share that with anyone new coming in. And I think that'll rub on off, rub off on them. Yeah. Is there anything specific or tangible that you do to encourage that culture? Yeah, something I do, which the team hate. Okay. You make a decision. You make the decision. <laughs> when they wow. ask me a question, mm-hmm. I'll say, I trust you, make a decision. And some people get really frightened by this. They go, oh my God, now the responsibilities, the responsibilities on my shoulders. Um, I used to be a lot more hands-on. Now I'm a little bit more, I would say, simple and direct. So, <laughs> I, I, and uh, so I just uh, that that's what I use that tone uh, with with people uh, that work with me. But like I said, a lot of the guys they know me now and know my habits as well. So it works. It would, it, you know, everyone knows. It, you know, it's fine. They can make decisions in certain areas. Yeah, yeah I yeah. love the uh, empowerment and the trust uh, behind it to mm. essentially just encourage them to take the decision, take the onus on them. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the one of the things I, I would say one thing about Strive is it's a bit of a boring company in some ways. 
uh, <laughs> culturally, we, we don't really do too many team building events and we don't really do too many social gatherings because I think what I've realized is that team building is really done in the day to day of how you work together. It's not done through a bowling night. You know, that's yeah. that's celebration. And that's different. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of always got this thing in the back of my mind that, you know, team building is really like really when you have to dig deep you know, and back each other up when it comes to, you know, something going on in the business. That's where your team building really is done. And then the, all the other things are really just celebrating, you know, hopefully, you know, a, a good good quarter. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's actually yeah. such a powerful philosophy. Mm. I've never seen it that way because, mm. and it reminds me of something that I heard uh, Alex Mosey talking about um, just on one of his clips where he goes, if you look at some of the most successful people in the world, they're just doing it's not about the bravado or the celebrations or like these out of the box activities that are going on. They're just doing the same thing over and over again. Might be a little bit boring, but they've just trained themselves to do it mm. repeatedly. Mm. And I think that's where you get to build mm. a more yeah. powerful culture. I mean, my, one of my favorite books, uh, business books is good to great. And they have this section in there where they're looking, assessing the top leaders in good to great and what makes them unique. And actually most of them had a charisma bypass where they weren't charismatic, but they built a culture in the company where people felt they were working for something meaningful for each other or a purpose that was much greater. So I think, you know, if you can sort of create that sort of atmosphere in your in your business, I think then you generally get the, the team uh, morale and that culture that you're looking for as well, so yeah. What would you say is the purpose of Strive that the team come together for? We all know running a business is difficult. We're here to try to give business owners what they deserve, which is more wealth protection, more freedom, and um, more sort of lifestyle satisfaction overall. So for us, we're passionate about really helping business owners because we know it's not easy to make a business successful. So, you know, we're here to try to support those business owners you know, become successful. And then we think that they'll contribute more so, you know, to a wider you know society as well. So for us, we feel we're, we're passionate about business owners and helping them, you know, become more successful because we think that that's where the major contribution to innovation and, and growth and employment and um, education comes from. So, yeah, that's, you know, for us, you know, they're the route to, to that for us. So, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned values mm -hmm. and service was at the forefront of those values. Mm. What are the other core values that you live by that you've also mm -hmm. implemented into Strive? remain down to earth <laughs> so sometimes things aren't as bad as you think and then sometimes things aren't as good as you think as well so <laughs> i think you have to um, be quite moderate in your approach um, so that's that's a major one um, always about there's always emphasis on self-learning keep learning and share your knowledge is another one um, you know in our industry things move and change very quickly so it's very important to you know put yourself out there don't wait for the knowledge to come to yourself you know get involved in understanding you know what changes are happening um so you know keep learning and share that that know-how so we look for look for individuals you know and people that fit that you know that sort of profile you know as well i love that cool amazing paddy thank you so much this has been an absolute pleasure Thanks, Dibesh. this was fun definitely <laughs> um oh actually i'm gonna ask you yeah. one little bonus question towards the end okay, okay. I'll try my uh, best. which is you already mentioned the book so mm. what if you could go back to your younger self mm -hmm. Okay, and give your younger self one piece of advice. Mm -hmm. What age would you go back to, and what would you say? I'd probably go back to when I first started my business, my first business at the age of 23, mm -hmm. and it would be get a financial director straight away in <laughs> your company. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, honestly. Yeah, just if you're a very creative entrepreneur. Uh, and you're not very a bit like me you don't really like admin and, and, and you like the more you know creative side of business development and stuff then just get a steady organizer in your company alongside you you know um, because they'll be worth their weight in gold and and save you a lot of time and hassle down the line and this is one of the lessons strong biggest lessons i got you know in business so far as well so Hence, we have a director of finance in, in, in Strive already I who's, who's vastly experienced <laughs> <laughs> oh that's amazing cool. Awesome. Paddy, thank you so much. Thanks, Dipesh. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Definitely. Excellent.